the Christians' understanding of Jesus changed and they started seeing him as less of just a human messiah and more as some kind of divine being. The video that we're about to watch features a portion of a conversation between Peter J. Williams and Bart Ehrman. And I want you to pay attention to the craftiness of Bart Ehrman. I hate to say that on the front like this, but it really is the case. He's very, very good at insinuating certain things that he hasn't actually proven and omitting other things that work conveniently against the case that he's trying to make. Let's dive in. When you lay out the sources chronologically, over time, Jesus starts changing the sorts of things that he says. And so, for example, in Mark and in Q, which would be the, the sayings in Matthew and Luke not found in Mark, those would probably be our earliest sources. Uh, Jesus principally talks about the kingdom of God that's coming. There's a kingdom of God that's coming. You need to repent and prepare for it because if you don't, you're going to be destroyed. If you are on the side of God, you'll enter into this kingdom and there'll be a, a glorious existence. And so Jesus is preaching about the coming kingdom of God uh, in, in Mark and Q. When you get to the Gospel of John, Jesus no longer preaches about the kingdom of God. He doesn't tell people to repent in preparation for the coming of the kingdom of God. He doesn't say that you, you will be destroyed when the kingdom of God comes. He, uh, th the way he talks is, is different now. And rather than talking principally about God and the coming kingdom, he talks about himself, who he is. And so you get the, some of the most famous sayings of Jesus. I am the, the way, I the am. truth, and the life. The way, the truth, and the life. No one comes mm. to the Father but by me. I am the light of the world. I am the bread of life. The before, good shepherd. I, yeah. Before Abraham was, I am. I mm. and the Father are one. You get mm. all of these claims, many of which have uh, a component of uh, divine identity connected with him. He's claiming to be a divine being. That's crystal clear in the narrative of John because whenever Je Jesus will say, I and the Father are one, and the Jews will pick up stones to stone him to death for committing blasphemy. You don't have those stories in the earliest Gospels. And it's, it's striking, and you have to explain, if Jesus did go around calling himself a divine being, um, you know, if that really happened, mm -hmm. as John says, mm -hmm. John says it mm -hmm. happened, uh, and it's, it's the major teaching of Jesus and John. If that's what happened, why isn't it in Mark or Q? Is it, is it that they didn't think it was important to report mm -hmm. that part of Jesus' teachings? Or a more plausible explanation for most people, for most critical scholars, a more plausible explanation is that over time, the Christians' understanding of Jesus changed, and they started seeing him as less of just a human messiah and more as some kind of divine being. All right, so Ehrman provides two explanations here. The first one is that they didn't think it was important. The second one is that the Christian understanding of Jesus changed over time. But here's a third. Each of the Gospels serves its own purpose. More on that in a second. Over time. And, and as they saw him that way, they recorded his words in those ways. And so the later sayings of John are later representations of what later Christians said about Jesus rather than what the earliest Christians. And if you think the earliest Christians said it, thought this about Jesus, why don't they record those sayings? So this developmental idea in the Gospels and, and <clears> the <throat> earlier Christian, later traditions around Jesus are developing the idea in the words. Yeah, I mean, I think this is a great example of showing how so much scholarship, while claiming to be historically neutral, is basically very philosophically driven. Because I think even as you tease out your chronology and your development, I mean, it's really interesting how it's all stacking up towards a system in which you don't get Jesus, you know, um, uh, claiming uh, as much early on. And I, th I think that it's, it's been developing for a, a couple hundred years in, in, within scholarship, and it's so intertwined, um, the historical argumentation and the sort of slight philosophical nudges here and there, that it's really, really hard to, mm. to unpick. Pick. But I would just say, let, let's take, take Mark's gospel as an example. Mark begins with this opening, you know, I'm going to send my messenger before your face, and it's all about, uh, you know, quoting the Old Testament, uh, but with um, uh, John the Baptist going before the face of Jesus when, you know, it's about uh, in Malachi uh, that it's uh, from, you know, uh, the messenger going before the face of God. And so it's presenting Jesus as in that place of God next chapter he's forgiving sins we have to read this verse really quick and see its context i promise i'll be fast and this is what it says and when jesus saw their faith he said to the paralytic son your sins are forgiven now some of the scribes were sitting there questioning in their hearts why does this man speak like that he is blaspheming who can forgive sins 
but God alone. And Jesus immediately perceiving in his spirit that they questioned within themselves said to them, why do you question these things in your hearts? Which is easier to say to the paralytic, your sins are forgiven or to say, rise, take up your bed and walk. And so I just wanted to highlight this because it's such a clear example right there in Mark chapter two of Jesus forgiving sins, doing something that only God can do and that being rightly understood by the audience to them saying he's a blasphemer for it couple of chapters later he's stilling the storm like only god does like and it's it's calling on themes from jonah a couple of chapters later uh chapter six he's walking on the water like only god does in job mm. chapter nine and then he gets to the the boat and he, he says uh, be of courage i am it's pretty dramatic i am there in mark 6 verse 50 so it uh, it's not just that you know john's i am saying is slightly different but there, there is precedent mm. uh, f for them and i'd want to say a lot of people see this as a systematic presentation of um uh, jesus's uh very very exalted status so, such that people are wondering you know who is this they're asking this question mm. and um the fact that it's doing it through um you know, a sort of more Socratic method of getting you to think who this is, is, you know, is not, I mean, God's the only one who opens the eyes of the blind. And that's also something Jesus does, you know, uniquely in the gospel. So I'd want to say that all of these things come together to give you a portrait, a very uh, exalted portrait of Jesus. So there's a there's a consistency as far as you're concerned between those earlier, if you like, accounts in Mark. I, th I, th I think the, 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 the whole question world. of development, you know, we've got to say when we lay out sources and we say this comes before this and this what actually are we basing that on how much is um historically verifiable uh, how much of it is philosophical system how much of it is literary uh, system and, and what's fed into that and i think all of those things have to be laid on the table so that you can be very clear about when you're saying this is this is a fact you know what's it actually based on uh you're saying that mark portrays jesus as divine mm -hmm. and that isn't that has no bearing on what i was saying I didn't deny that. I think that Mark does see Jesus as divine. What I'm asking is, what did Jesus himself say about himself? Now, mm -hmm. uh, you pointed out things like uh, John the Baptist looking to Jesus, Jesus walking in the water, Jesus healing the blind. I mean, we could talk about each of all those, but I'm agreeing, I'm agreeing okay. that Mark portrays Jesus as divine. My question is, did Jesus go around Palestine, Galilee, and then Judea, saying, I and the Father are one. Before Abraham was, I am. I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but by me. These are mm -hmm. sayings found in the Gospel of John, which you agree is the mm -hmm. last mm -hmm. of the Gospels. Those sayings are not found in Mark, which you agree is an earlier Gospel. And they're not only found not in Mark. They're not found in Luke. They're not found in Matthew. They're not from Q. They're not in any of the early sources where Jesus says these things. When you pointed out that in Mark's gospel, people continually are asking, who is this? Mm -hmm. The answer is never, he is God. And Jesus himself never says, I am God in Matthew, Mark, Luke, I totally, or their sources. I, I to totally agree on that. I mean, there could be all sorts of reasons not to say that. What Bart Ehrman is driving home here is what I call the every word in that exact order fallacy. And it's actually really, really simple if you think about it. So let me break this down really, really quick. With Jesus, you have these checklists that you need to look at and you have these claims that you need to look at. So you look at Jesus and you say, does he forgive sins? Yes. Does he receive worship from people? Yes. Is he called a blasphemer? I wonder why. Yes. Does he take that prophetic, glorious Daniel 7 title and apply it to himself? One of those clear moments in the Old Testament where you see the Godhead, you see the Ancient of Days and the Son of Man in the Godhead. Yes, he does do that. Does he die and then rise again What with telling us that he was going to do that? Yes. Well, but he didn't say that he's God in those exact words. He didn't say, he didn't sort of break the fourth wall and look at the camera and say, although they're calling me Jesus from Nazareth, I actually am God in Mark. So therefore must be a different guy. This would be like looking at Superman. Now this is an analogy and saying, is he able to leap tall buildings in a single bound? Yes. Is he more powerful than a locomotive? Yes. Is he faster than a speeding bullet? Yes. Does he say that he's from the planet Krypton? Yes. But did he ever break the fourth wall, look directly at the camera and say, my name is Clark Kent, but I am actually Superman. No, I, come to think of it, I didn't see him do that anywhere in the comics. Ah, must be a different guy. Do you see the problem with this every word in the exact order fallacy?
what I want to say is there is precedent for all of the I am saying. So, for instance, um, Jesus, um, you know, I am the bread of life. He says in the synoptics, this is my body, you know, take take this bread. Um, he, um, you know, says, I am the good shepherd in John. And then he's portraying himself in stories as, as basically fulfilling the role of the shepherd. Um, he says, you know, I am the light of the world in John. In Matthew, he says, you are the light of the world to his disciples. If he's prepared to accept they're the light of the world, I don't see why he can't say that he is as well. So I think all of these things, we can, we can, we can make connections. Um, and I don't think, th yes, the, the Gospels are about nine hours long when you read them in English. So in this two-hour section of John, there are things which aren't in the others. But don't build a massive, you know, um, castle out of that. I mean, it seems, seems to me, of course, there are going to be some things that yes. are in one that aren't in the no, others. No, I, I, I agree with that. And I'm not trying to build a castle out of it because I, I'm just responding to Justin's question. Let's look at an alternative explanation to the one that Bart Ehrman provides here. And it's actually quite simple. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John are presenting a different dimension or emphasis of who Jesus is for a particular reason, because they're aiming at a different audience. And so they're serving a different purpose. So Matthew in Matthew, you see Christ as the son of David, the rightful heir to the Messianic throne. We see Christ's royal genealogy, the visit by the Magi from the East to announce his kingly birth and the proclamation of his laws in the Sermon on the Mount. And then in Mark, we see Jesus as the servant of God. Although Jesus came as God to earth, he completely submitted himself to the will of the Father in heaven and took the form of a servant. Anything extraneous to that theme is excluded, which is why the narrative contains no references to Jesus's birth or youth. So again, it's a particular emphasis for a particular audience serving a particular purpose. Now in Luke, we see Jesus as the son of man, fully human, but unlike any other human being in his perfect submission to God's will. For this reason, Luke traces the genealogy back to Adam, the first human, which is also significant for other reasons that we don't have time to get into now. Then finally, in John, we see that Jesus presents himself as the son of God, fully divine. Jesus is not only flesh and bones, he's also the creator of all things. The in the beginning that is listed in John chapter one, Jesus reveals his nature as the I am, a title given as his own name. God is using different people to write different accounts from their perspectives of this real history that took place, of this real Jesus that took place, but then pulling out from that real life and ministry of Jesus, their emphasis to apply it to the audience that they are speaking to. And through the combination of these four narratives, you see the authenticity ring out and you see this really beautiful, multifaceted portrayal of the historic Jesus. There's so much more that could be said on this. It's obviously a topic that, if you can't tell, I'm very passionate about. But with that being said, I really appreciate you guys watching. Thank you so much wherever you stand on this issue. Would love to hear your comments. Would love to hear your thoughts. Would love to hear if there's anything that I missed, anything that I omitted, anything that you disagree with or you think that should be included into a conversation like this. With all that being said, thanks again, guys, and I'll see you in the next one. Bye.